there is nothing quite like a royal wedding. And on the 19th of May, the world will witness a royal wedding unlike any we've seen before. It was very romantic. He got on one knee. <laughs> Prince Harry has announced his wedding engagement to Meghan Markle. Enrique de Inglaterra y la actriz estadounidense Meghan Markle. Toronto, Canada is waking up to this news. The two are set to wed in spring of 2018. Wait, spring of 2018? That's coming up. Like all royal weddings, we can expect an eye-catching spectacle of pageantry. And here's a wonderful fairy tale sight. Weddings are moments through which a nation defines itself. And we were there, front row, well, nearly front row seats. In this film, Trevor and I discover exactly what it takes to put on the perfect royal wedding by inviting you to share the behind-the-scenes secrets from those in the know, both past and present. From the dress designers... We had to be very careful not to let any scraps fall on the floor because we had a lot of journalists going through the rubbish to see what colour the dress was like. To the cake makers... we just finished the cake and I remember Harry came bounding in and then he pretended to box with the top decoration and we were like, oh no! And from the bridesmaids... I do remember Diana getting ready and she has her tiara on and she's still in her jeans. To the lucky guests... This arrived after the wedding with a piece of wedding cake inside, which sadly is no longer there because I ate it. As the couple themselves count down to their big day... We'll be cordially inviting you to celebrate with us the forthcoming wedding of His Royal Highness Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. royal wedding only weeks away, the eyes of the world turn to the small town of Windsor as it prepares for the biggest event of the year. I still have memories of the 600,000 people who lined the streets in 1981 for the wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana. And there were almost twice as many when the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge got married seven years ago. So for this royal wedding, the crowds in Windsor are likely to exceed all records. An impending wedding may be exciting for the country, of course, and for the couple, but for those in the royal household, it means a to-do list like no other. It's not just the dress, food and flowers that anyone has to think about when getting married. A royal wedding to-do list includes police to be arranged, military bands to be chosen, and horses to be trained. But as with any wedding, the first thing on the to-do list is to secure the venue. Harry and Meghan will be married in St George's Chapel at Windsor Castle, a place of special significance for the royal family. Prince Harry himself was baptised here, and this is where Prince Charles and Camilla received their marriage blessings in 2005. Are there absolutely regimented rules about where members of the royal family will sit, where the queen will sit? Well, we're standing in the nave at the moment, uh, and the choir is uh, uh, behind me. On the 19th of May, both parts of the chapel will be full of congregation, and the, the wedding itself will happen at the high altar uh, at the far end of the chapel. Plans are not yet finalised for exactly which seat, but the queen will be sitting in this chapel to watch her grandson get married but this would be no small family event. For many years, royal weddings took place in private, behind closed doors. Now, they're shared not just with the country, but with the world. Although Prince Harry is a global figure, he's now only sixth in line to the British throne. So he has a little more freedom in his choices for his wedding day than his older brother, William. Prince William could not have chosen this intimate family venue when he got married because, of course, he had to do everything on the scale of a future king. Royal journalist Duncan Larkin was a guest at this wedding in 2011 when Prince William married Catherine Middleton. So this is the order of service from William and Kate's wedding. It's quite a collector's item. Every guest at the royal wedding had one of these on their seat. And when I look back now, 
Um, these can sell on eBay for fifteen hundred pounds plus. Thinking I should have just gone round with a trolley, and nick the lot. <laughs> if you see uh, at ten forty-five, fanfare is sounded, and that's when the Queen arrives. The Queen is greeted by the Dean of Westminster. So the Queen had to sit there 15 minutes. That's probably the longest time she's ever waited for anyone in her life. Well, it probably really is. <laughs> there was a genuine sense, as there will be on Harry's wedding day, that everyone in that room was witnessing a piece of history. A smile from Prince William as he sees his bride for the first time on their wedding day. Unlike Harry, the guest list for the second in line to the throne had to include heads of state and politicians. But there were also celebrities, from Elton John and David Furnish to the Beckhams and Alexandra Shulman, who was then editor of British Vogue magazine. So this is a beautiful little clotted cream colour tin which arrived after the wedding with a piece of wedding cake inside, which sadly is no longer there because I ate it. And um, it says William and Catherine, 29th of April, 2011. Receiving an invitation to a royal wedding is utterly thrilling. And in my case, it was a surprise. And you immediately start thinking, well, what am I going to wear, in fact? <laughs> sort of starts to supersede what the bride is going to wear. And that's the great thing about weddings. They're the perfect excuse to treat ourselves to a new suit, buy a lovely hat and celebrate the happy couple. In Royal Windsor, Trevor and I have an invitation to an exclusive dress rehearsal for the royal wedding. Excitement is mounting as the main event shows hints of a departure from what's gone before. For Meghan and Harry, we're already seeing them marry tradition and innovation in their wedding. For example, they announced that they are going to invite school children, which I think is a powerful gesture to say, you know, we are not just an exclusive family enjoying ourselves at the top of society. You know, these are things I think ordinary people will relate to. As the royal procession approaches the altar, here comes the bride on her father's arm. Waiting for her, his Royal Highness Prince Harry with his brother Prince William, the best man. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the sight of God and in... With the decision to place school children at the heart of this royal wedding, one local school is playing out how they think the ceremony might go. I, Harry... Take thee, Meghan... Take thee, Meghan... To my wedded wife to my wedded wife. I'm playing Queen Elizabeth. I'm Prince Philip and I think it was like, really, I felt like really important and really royal. How do you think Meghan's going to be feeling on the day? Quite nervous because she might get her words um, the wrong way around and... You think she would get her words the wrong way around? Well, she might and she might accidentally trip over on a dress. Talking of which, the second thing on the royal wedding to-do list is the dress. Ever since Harry and Meghan's engagement was announced, the speculation amongst fashion journalists about who gets to design the dress has been feverish. But the one thing we know for sure is that by tradition, the dress remains under official wraps until the very moment we get to see the bride. Here is the picture that every woman will be watching closely. Her Royal Highness, the bride. The tradition of the white wedding dress is really very recent and it comes from Queen Victoria. Previous to her, brides would wear any colour. When Victoria got married, she was in pure white, which signalled to the world that she was this innocent girl and so different to the debauched monarchs who'd gone before. And there still is this convention across the board, even the most fashion forward, the most celebrity of brides, everyone still wears white. I think for designers, it's a, a very um, important balancing act. It's not a moment when they can kind of spread their design wings. It's more a moment where they can bring their own kind of aesthetic, um, their own trademarks, and kind of hone it down into this dress that's going to be one of the most famous things they'll ever do. 
the most famous wedding dress of all time was the one made for Harry's mother, Lady Diana Spencer. That's the picture of Princess Diana leaving one of the fittings. It was created by Elizabeth Emmanuel and her then husband David in 1981. Well, we'd recently graduated from the Royal College of Art and we'd just set up the business. So uh, I think we've been in business about a year, not even that. So that's my favourite picture. It's yet to have its flounce put on around the neck. And I don't even think it's got its lace on yet. The lace was embellished with more than 10,000 pearls and sequins sewn on by Elizabeth and the team. We were all about drama, something that was going to be different, that was going to create a whole new look for brides, something romantic and wild. And we knew it was going to be part of history and we wanted it to reflect that history. Um, and also Diana's youth and beauty. Images of Diana in the Emmanuel's designs are world famous, but lesser known are the treasured secrets of the workmanship. So here are the trunks. And these contain lots of royal wedding bits and pieces, including the royal wedding pattern. This pattern was laid on the fabric and the fabric was cut out. And this was a long process because Lady Diana at the time lost so much weight, so we had to keep altering the toile. So that's very, very precious. So you can actually see bits of the real fabric here. I kept every scrap and we had to be very careful not to let any scraps fall on the floor because uh, we didn't want them to end up in the rubbish because we had a lot of journalists going through the rubbish to see what colour the dress was like. And so I've kept them pretty much as they were on the cutting table, no matter how small. Every thread was important as far as I was concerned. Because it was so long ago, but there are certain things, you know, that do really, really take you back. As Diana arrived in the carriage, the world's eyes were on the ivory silk taffeta dress with its record-breaking 25-foot-long train. We did know it would crease a bit, but when I saw her arrive at St Paul's and we saw the creases, I actually felt faint. I was horrified, really because it was quite a lot of, of creasing there. I mean, we'd done a dress rehearsal, but that was with calico, so it was a lot more than we thought. But in retrospect, you know, then looking at the footage afterwards, I think that's my favourite bit as she comes out the coach, because she's a bit like a, a caterpillar, you know, um, and, and turning into a butterfly, so she's emerging from the chrysalis, and, and it just goes on and on and on and on. And as she's going up the steps, the end of her train is still in the carriage, and then the wind catches her veil, and the most dramatic pictures ever are from that bit when she's going up the steps towards St Paul's. So I, I love that now. We wanted to make her the ultimate fairy tale princess, really. Of course, many of the details of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's wedding remain a mystery, and the most closely guarded secret what the bride will be wearing. Do you think this looks anything like the dress that Meghan Markle would wear at the wedding? Well, not quite. Mm -hmm. I'm putting love hearts on to make it very royal. Why do you think love hearts particularly royal? Or? Uh, because it makes, makes everybody think they're welcome to the wedding. At St Edward's First School in Windsor, preparations are gathering pace for the forthcoming wedding celebrations. I've been making Meghan Markle's dress and I think it would be beautiful like this. Well, at first I had an idea of doing some stripes. What sort of dress do you think she'll wear on her wedding day? Um, probably just a plain white dress. <laughs> no surprise there then, but the big question about the dress is who will get to design it? Of all the wedding dresses of the past, the identity of the designer for Catherine Middleton's dress was the most closely guarded secret. Even those making it were kept in the dark, from the factory in Nottinghamshire providing the lace, all the way to the embroiderers stitching the design at the Royal School of Needlework in Hampton Court Palace. Some reps came down 
not saying what the commission was. And we were asked to quote for a Italian costume drama with black lace, um, a very tight schedule. They asked what's the chances of being able to work longer hours and having a lot of staff in. And I said, um, well, yes, maybe if you're the Queen, yes, you might be able to. Um, not knowing at the time that actually it was for the Royal Wedding Dress. The team only found out what they were going to be making when they were asked to sign a confidentiality contract. They had to work hidden away behind closed doors and curtains drawn, not able to tell even their nearest and dearest. It was hard keeping it a secret, but my fiancé had no idea, my parents had no idea. So living at home uh, with two brothers and a sister, quite difficult when you're suddenly uh, not at home very much. The embroiderers were busy creating a design fit for a future queen. It was covered in symbolic flowers, just like Princess Elizabeth's dress in 1947. While Elizabeth's flowers of spring promised rebirth after the hardships of war, Kate's dress included flowers from all corners of the United Kingdom, from shamrocks to roses. We had to cut out hundreds and hundreds of tiny pieces of the motif from different types of lace and apply them to a net backing and then stitch on with tiny stitches which were completely invisible. We had a template to follow so we knew exactly where each piece was to the millimetre. It's quite hard on the eyes as well yes. because of the net yeah. um, and it's being white. White on white mm. is quite hard. We were washing our hands every 30 minutes just to make sure that the threads were pristine, that the work itself was pristine but the team still didn't know who the designer was. Her identity, Sarah Burton of Alexander McQueen, wasn't revealed to the public until the morning of the wedding itself, when she was caught on camera, arriving at the bride's hotel. One hadn't thought of that sort of the, the brand Alexander McQueen as, as dressing royals at all. At the time, it was a, it was a brave decision. His clothes could be quite frightening in some ways, very kind of out there, quite macabre. And I think what she was able to see was the detail, the interest in symbolism and the theatricality of it could be shaped to be relevant for, for a royal wedding. When Catherine stepped out of the car and I saw the dress for the first time, um, I cried, a lot of tears, a lot of happy tears. I sort of turned to my fiancé and said, um, so you know I've not been seeing very much of you recently, I've been a bit busy. Um, that's the reason why that dress that Catherine is wearing is what I've been working on. And he was slightly bemused, I think, because uh, obviously he'd be wondering what else I might be keeping secret for that amount of time. Um, but he was very proud. When I saw her arrive and start to walk up the aisle and I just saw how beautiful the dress in terms of the, the silhouette of it and the grace of it and the, the elegance of it, I just thought, yay, the girl's done good. Of course, once the bride has chosen her dress, it's only just the beginning. What comes next is what to go with it, the jewellery, the shoes, the hair and the makeup and, of course, the flowers. And it's not just a matter of personal taste, the flowers are also likely to be rich in symbolism and history, as royal florist Paul Thomas explains. This is myrtle, which is a real tradition in royal bouquets, going right back to um, Queen Victoria's daughter. So what sort of style and taste might we expect for an American bride, do you think? We are almost certainly going to see some peonies. It's that full flower and, and that, that full colour of roses, like, for example, these. They're so beautiful, aren't they? Oh, they are so romantic. Paul is spot on. It's since been announced that Harry and Meghan have chosen peonies and white roses, as well as foliage from local royal parks. And so how can you ever miss the lily of the valley, which is the flower for May, the most amazing perfume, I think, in the world? It's exquisite, isn't it? I cannot imagine that they will not be used. And I remember, actually, ahead of the last big royal wedding, these were all planted around the bases of the trees that they had lining the aisle. We were allowed in the night before to have a look around the abbey. 
And the thing that struck you most when you went through the door was just the perfume. From oh, the it must have it's been wonderful. Thing. It was incredible. Yeah. Oh, how lovely. Longman's florists in London made their first royal bouquet for Princess Elizabeth in 1947. They went on to make bouquets for everyone from Princess Margaret to Sarah Ferguson and Lady Diana in 1981. Her bouquet, orchids and pale gardenias, dark myrtle and golden Mount Patton roses. Head of the family firm at the time was David Longman, whose florist daughter Lottie is recreating Diana's bouquet to show us just what's involved. Did you have a meeting with Lady Diana to discuss the Yes, I went, we did exactly the same procedure as for the Queen. I went to see her. I also went to see the dress designer, uh, the Emanuels. Yes. They wanted it to be large, and so did she. And then we made a sample bouquet, and she said, I want it bigger than that. And what did you say to that? Your wish is my command. Well, Lady Diana showed me how she wanted it to be like that. So I took a tape measure and said, it's going to be 42 inches, like that. Is that all right? She said, that's fine. This, for the time afterwards, changed the whole fashion. Did you have to instruct Diana about how to carry the bouquet? Very much so. One always instructs a bride how to hold the bouquet, because if you're not careful, a bride will hold it up like a chest protector. I don't know why they just go there. It has to be held down, so it enhances the dress. So I'm just going to put the um, traditional piece of uh, myrtle into the bouquet. Lottie, there's a lot of work that goes into the creation of a bouquet like this. Well, a, a huge amount of work. Every single flower is individually wired and then taped so that the moisture is held into, into the flower so they survive. Even the lily of the valley has a silver wire that runs down. And the, the size of this bouquet? And this is the 42 inches. Right? Absolutely exactly. 42 yes. inches. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. We made two bouquets. The first one had to be delivered, which I delivered, at um, 8 o'clock to Buckingham Palace. And we had a police escort with motorcyclists who took us all through the city to Buckingham Palace. And then we came back. When well, that time they'd finished the second bouquet, and back we went again. What's the point of having two bouquets? Well, if we go back to um, the Queen's wedding in 1947, when you look at the state photographs of all the bridesmaids and the royal guests, and there's the Queen without a bouquet. It got lost. So in the middle of their honeymoon, they had to get dressed up again in their wedding clothes, and my father had to provide another bouquet for those photographs. So now it's a tradition that now they always two bouquets. So two bouquets, so that doesn't happen again. So the dress is sorted, the flowers are underway, and the clock is ticking. Next on the to-do list is the food, the centrepiece of which, of course, is the cake. I wasn't sure if I could actually do it, because I'd never done anything this size before and it's for our future king. So I had to then come up with the goods, if you like, because I certainly didn't want to end up in the tower. <laughs> Megan might like some of those cakes. Do you think? Yeah, I think so. With a street party planned to celebrate the royal wedding, the school children in Windsor have moved on to the next thing on their own to-do list, cakes. If you were coming up with your dream ingredients for their wedding cake, what would you put in? I would probably put in chocolate and cream and some sprinkles on top of the cream. I hear that Megan is going to have, um, is it lemon and elderflower? Have you heard? Yeah. First, some baking news. Uh, they're not your average couple, and it seems Harry and Megan have bucked tradition. We've been to Hackney to find out more. Small, understated and a hackney favourite. The Violet Bakery is everything Windsor is not. But according to the locals, that's exactly what makes it the perfect choice for your wedding cake. So we might know this is the bakery, but the cake, of course, is being made in complete secrecy. 
the fact the Baker Clap attack is like Megan, a Californian, gives us a hint we'll be seeing a bit of American taste on a very British occasion. And the lemon and elderflower is certainly a far cry from the traditional fruitcakes of the past. British biscuit makers McVitie's have been responsible for royal showstoppers ever since the reign of Queen Victoria. And in 1947, they made the nine foot high, 500 pound wedding cake for Princess Elizabeth. But over half a century later, their head cake chef, Paul Courtney, was asked to make something with a more personal touch for Prince William's wedding. So Paul, tell me about this recipe for this special cake. We were given the recipe by the royal household. And we went there thinking, well, we'll probably going to be making a fruit cake, as you do for weddings. And they said, no, we'd love you to make a chocolate biscuit cake, um, which, fantastically for us, was made with uh, rich tea biscuits. And it was one of the Queen's favourites when she was a girl. And Prince William used to be packed off to school with it. Um, they gave us a recipe, which is a heck of a privilege. Uh, so I took it away and guarded it with my life. I can't tell you too much, because it's a secret. So these biscuits had a part in a big royal wedding? <laughs> Absolutely, a big part. Can we nick one now, do you think? I think so, yeah. <laughs> the cake was designed and made undercover at McVitie's research and development facility just outside London. So, Paul, what level of secrecy are we talking about when it came to this cake? Well, it was off the scale. Um, it was all very much cloak and dagger. Basically, we just, we just blacked out the windows. We had secure door locks everywhere. Only certain people had access. We had security cameras. There are cameras in there? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you needed to know what was happening when you weren't there. Paul's partner in clandestine cake making was royal chocolatier Barry Colenso. So, Barry, tell me what your role was in this amazing partnership for making the cake. Well, my role really was to to bring the chocolate dream to life. You know, all we knew was that it was going to be this recipe from the palace, um, and everything else really was up for grabs. Barry produced various designs, and in the end, the royal couple decided on one featuring white chocolate dahlias. Are you going to show me how you begin to put one of these together? We're going to try. <laughs> so the first thing we need to do is pop a bit of chocolate bit on of there. So oh, you okay. do that one. Do a bit of this. How did you end up doing dahlias? What was the significance of it? Because dahlias stand for longevity and love. So, assuming this, they are going to stay in love for a long time. OK, that's fine. Okay. So, okay. then, what we need to do <laughs> is to make our ball. Right. So, we need to stick these two together, like that. Very good. OK. You're a natural. I don't think so. Right, so now we've got three layers of petals, six petals on each layer. We'll start with the, the little ones. So Gosh, this looks your six. so delicate. This These are my six. So they're stuck to the paper, so what you need to do is peel them off. Yeah, dunk them in. Dunk them, dip them, and then put it underneath the and ball this as well. and spray it. Right, OK. So oh. the clock ticking. Yeah. Now spray it. That's it. Perfect. The patience that you need. Did you just spend hours doing these? It took a long time. First one I did from start to finish took me four hours. Good heavens. I can do them now in about 20 minutes. Ta da! Having kept the cake secret for three months, the biggest challenge for Barry and Paul was still to come. How do you make sure that on the day it can't go wrong? And if you make one cake, then clearly you're, you're at risk. So we actually made two full cakes like this one here, and we knew we had to transport it to Buckingham Palace. So we organised two vehicles that would go drive separately, because what happens if one's in an accident? We were carrying precious cargo. I took one of the vans and drove the route three times, literally noting every pothole, every corner, everything, to make sure that we knew that at mile three there was a deep pothole and on the left-hand side of the near carriageway <laughs> and don't run over it. So the relief when you got it there safely must have been enormous. Yeah. And then you got to assemble it. Yes, no, absolutely. So we had the cake as it, as it is here um, and then we had to apply all the decoration. Barry and Paul were at Buckingham Palace for two days, no pressure. putting the chocolate panels and flowers on the cake. We, we'd just finished the cake on the day. We'd literally just put the top on, and of course, at that point, it's just like, oh, the collective sigh of relief. Uh, Barry and I hugged. Uh, I think there was a tear in my eye. We've done it. It looks fantastic. 
And I remember Harry came in, Harry came bounding in, and Harry was how you'd expect him to be, just a, a, a fun uh, joker. And he walked up to it, very enthusiastic, oh, wow, fantastic, is this chocolate? And he, and he picked a piece of chocolate up and <laughs> ate it. And then he pretended to box with the top decoration, and we were like, oh, no! But again, it was just, yeah, it was just, it was fun, but slightly heart-stopping moments. Royal wedding cakes have always been closely guarded, from Princess Elizabeth's, whose bakers slept overnight in the factory to protect it, to Princess Diana's, made and secured on a naval base in Chatham. But of all the royal wedding cakes, the one made for Prince Charles's marriage to Camilla Parker Bowles was the hardest to keep safe from prying eyes. It was created in a tiny cake shop in Lincolnshire. Well, because we have a shop, and a shop by nature has windows, we're also in a village. So trying to keep secrets in a village is virtually impossible. So I said to my business partner, I think we need to find somewhere that is safe and secure where people aren't going to see what we're doing. And so the nearest place we could think of was just behind our little shop unit is our local Woodhall Methodist Church. So this is where we will hold up for the three days um, that it took us to decorate the cake. My business partner and I were in here in front of the altar. We had things drying all along these radiators at the back, all the way around the room, and we could hear all this chit-chat, chit-chat, the other side of the partition. Luckily, we had the vertical blinds closed, but we could hear all this going on next door, and I said, if only they knew what was actually being made in this section of the church itself. And what was being made was no small feat. Dawn's cake weighed 17 stone and had to feed 800 people. Not only was I asked to do this huge wedding cake, but I was also asked to supply 2,500 slices for the commemorative tins for the same day. So a huge, huge task. Even the food at a royal wedding is steeped in tradition. From dishes named after the bride and groom, like Prince Philip's Philly de Soul Montbatten on his wedding menu, to cakes decorated with royal crests, like these of the Prince of Wales. Where you have the plaques, some of them are just iced and over iced again. And then onto the flowers, we did roses for England, and we did daffodils and leeks for Wales, and we've got thistles for Scotland. And then these corners were all covered over as well, just to soften it slightly. Most of it was done literally on a wing and a prayer. We were just hoping that it would all work. We had no time for error. No, nothing could go wrong. Otherwise, yeah, we'd be letting down the future King of England. Oh, very frightening. <laughs> so as the day itself approaches, there are always a few minor details to be finalised. The police and the military to be arranged, the horses to be prepared, and of course, the seating plan to be navigated. The biggest headache of a wedding is the guest list. When a normal person gets married, you're worried about, can we put Auntie Pam near Uncle Roger because they got divorced 20 years ago? Imagine that on steroids. That's basically a royal wedding. Ever since Queen Victoria, royal weddings have gone from being private occasions behind closed doors to national events celebrated with the people. An estimated one million people were lining the processional route. Many of them got here days ago, and this is what they came for. But managing the crowds is a huge task for those in the royal household coordinating the day. It's incredibly collaborative. It involves you know, transport for London, or in this case, you know, the, the authorities in Windsor, Thames Valley Police, you've got royal parks, you've got military, you've got you know, a number of different um, broadcasters. It's, it's an enormous number. And sometimes you have to take some tough calls. So a few days before William's wedding, I stood just behind the Queen Victoria Memorial. This is a few days out, where they were building the final bit of the camera stand. And I realised they were building it to the wrong dimensions. <laughs> and the crowd were going to see nothing. <laughs> All those thousands of people in the crowd who were going to be there for hours to see the balcony moment 
Okay, we're just going to see blocked. have their view blocked by, <laughs> by a whole big stand. And I, and I remember saying to a very senior technician uh, from one of the broadcasters, I said, we've got to do this again. We've got to take it down. And he looked at me as if I was completely mad. And I said, we do. This is too big. Bottom line is that we've got to get the right balance for the crowd. One way of sharing the occasion with the people is a procession through the streets. In Windsor, the household cavalry and armed forces will flank the carriage, providing both security and pageantry. Retired coachman Alfie Oates worked for the Royal Muse for 55 years and took part in seven royal weddings. Here we come for the pickup. Ooh, steady. Make sure I don't run over the bride's feet. At Prince Andrew's wedding, nice move off. Alfie was riding closest to the carriage, leading both his horse and the one next to him. That's me. This is the 1902 State Road Landor, built for King Edward VII, drawn by four grey horses. Gosh, it's going fast. The State Landau took the newlyweds from Westminster Abbey to the palace, and then Alfie had to attach the horses to a different carriage for the next job. They're going on honeymoon now. To the station. It's a very long day for the horses, really. We probably would have started at half past four or five o'clock. Whoosh. And the cavalry is straightening themselves up. They're all going very nicely. What you've been aiming for for months, training them. It's always nice to get off the horse at the end and give them a pat and say, well, well done. Like all royal brides before her, when Meghan Markle leaves St George's Chapel on the 19th of May, she'll be joining the most famous family in the world. Just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet and, and natural and very romantic. He got on one knee. <laughs> when Meghan Markle marries into the royal family, her life is going to change. She's a public individual. And this has always been very hard for royal brides. So Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, when she was being courted by the future George VI, she was very unsure, and in fact, she turned him down quite a few times because of her concern about living in the Royal Goldfish Bowl. And the governess of Princess Elizabeth said, royals are only private in the womb. And that was in the 50s. And the scrutiny on royal brides has only intensified a hundredfold. Capturing Meghan's every move, would be royal photographer Chris Jackson. He photographed the couple's engagement and will be taking pictures on their wedding day, just as he did for Prince William's wedding in 2011. There was weeks of sort of preparation, technical preparation, mental preparation. I came down here quite a few times, made sure I had the right equipment, making sure everything was charged, checking it, checking it again. Chris was one of hundreds of photographers taking pictures that day. They were shooting in panoramic, 3D, and at all key positions along the route. So my spot on the day of the wedding was down on the memorial down here, right outside the front steps of Westminster Abbey. I was down there very early, I think about six o'clock. It was a beautiful spring morning. I just remember the amazing atmosphere when I got down there early and, you know, people were waking up from tents and there was a, there was a lot of excitement in the air. This particular spot uh, was quite important to catch those first moments of the Duke and Duchess emerging onto the steps as a married couple. And I'd, I'll never forget the kind of the roar of the crowd, the chorus of camera shutters going off. You've got seconds to capture a moment in history, a moment that's going to live on. And I was very lucky that the Duke and Duchess both looked straight towards me. And actually, when I saw the picture on the back of the camera, there was a huge kind of wave of relief that went through me that I hadn't totally buggered it up, basically. Within minutes of the first photograph of the married couple being taken, it had been shared worldwide. Twitter users were posting 237 tweets every second about the royal wedding. This time with Prince Harry marrying a Hollywood actress, wedding fever is set to go sky high around the world. Meghan comes from a different country and she's had a totally different career to any of the contemporary royals. And on top of that, she has this black heritage. So I think that's more normal and I think more people relate to it. Everyone is listening and I'm in the same room as the royal couple right now. I think it's 
brilliant and hilarious how people are projecting themselves onto this wedding, you know, and I mean, there's so many memes on social media kind of showing Nigerian families dancing down the aisle and Jamaicans having a jerk barbecue at Windsor. I mean, it's hilarious because she's not Jamaican and she's not Nigerian, but I think a lot of people with proud black identities are just projecting themselves onto this because this is the first chance they've had to relate to someone personally that is having a royal wedding. But who will get a golden ticket to attend on the big day? It's already been revealed there'll be no politicians or diplomats on the guest list, just friends, family and people from the charities the couple support and admire. Could we have the ring, please? But we've yet to find out who will be the page boys and bridesmaids. Although these roles have already been taken in the Windsor School's role play of the royal wedding. With this ring, I thee wed. What was it like being a royal bridesmaid? What did it make you think? A bit gross. It was a bit gross. <laughs> this huge honour of being a royal bridesmaid was shared by India Hicks, bridesmaid to Prince Charles and Lady Diana in 1981. The two senior bridesmaids, Lady Sarah and Miss Hicks, descended the steps to be ready for the bride and the dress. Tell me first of all how you came to be bridesmaid. Well, I have a very wonderful, loyal, extraordinary godfather who happens to be the Prince of Wales. <laughs> and when the invitation came through at first, I thought, this is fantastic. And then I thought, oh my God, I've got to wear a dress. And of course, 1980s wedding. <laughs> Lordy, that is a moment in fashion that I think <laughs> many of us would like to, to remove Hide from our memories. photos. <laughs> yes, completely. And what was the atmosphere like when you were getting ready? Amazing, just like any wedding, lots of chaos, um, lots of excitement. And I do remember a knock at the door and Princess Margaret so sweetly coming in for me to borrow her toothbrush. That was quite a moment, deciding whether to use the Queen's sister's toothbrush or not. And I do also remember Diana getting ready and she has her tiara on and she's still in her jeans, so that's kind of a remarkable sight. And then she gets into the dress and she's standing in the middle of the room. And at that moment, it just, it felt wonderful. It really did. Um, and it felt like a family affair. And the girls, really a wonderful fairy tale sight. There are so many millions watching all over the world. What memories do you have of the carriage ride? Sitting with Prince Edward, who I had grown up with so, so new, and both of us being very concerned about one of the bridesmaids there with us, and who I didn't know, and of course she was very small and allergic to horses. <laughs> And no one had anticipated this. How could we? Uh, and of course, she, her eyes were streaming, streaming. Her nose was streaming. She kept wiping her nose on her dress, on this silk dress. <laughs> on the silk dress. And Edwin and I were trying to cope with this very, very, very miserable child inside the carriage. That's quite a memory, isn't yes. it? Yes. I'll never look at those dresses in quite the same way. No, snot. <laughs> snot all over the silk. Royal bridesmaids have always had not only the best seats for the service and the procession, but also a coveted invitation to the reception. Oh, there we are, arriving at Buckingham Palace. I don't remember seeing this. Annabel Cope was one of Princess Margaret's bridesmaids. I should think we were probably quite glad that it was all over. That's what I remember, the people surging towards the gates. It was just the most amazing sight in the world. It was like lots of octopuses, if you like, waving arms. It was just incredible. And the noise of people shouting. There I am, leaning in front of the Queen, struck by just the, the numbers of people. Brings back all those feelings, being on that balcony again. Um, magical. From the palace balcony, Elizabeth and her husband waved to the cheering crowd. Throughout history, royal weddings have been the biggest advertisement for the royal family. Weddings are moments through which a nation defines itself. So I think this marriage symbolically does have a role to play in our perceptions of what Britishness is and who gets to be included. This is a royal wedding which I think edges the British monarchy into the 21st century. From an American of mixed race, now at the heart of the royal family, to the inclusion on the guest list of schoolchildren, 
rather than politicians, and the choice of organic cakes and sustainable floristry. This is a royal wedding for a modern age. But let's leave the final word to the people who really matter, the bride and groom and their friends and family. If you had any advice to Meghan and Harry for their big day, what would you say? I would say, don't be worried because you'll have each other to love and to hold. To smile a lot and be really happy. I'd say, good behaviour. <laughs> um, stay calm. Don't be nervous. I'd probably say, don't worry, it's okay. Because it will all be all right. It's Harry and Meghan's big day, but it's also the people's wedding, to which we are all invited.